Hi guys! This week's video is going to be a little bit of a mixed bag. Later this week, the window should allow me to apply the last coats of epoxy primer on the hull. But for the next couple of days, it's going to rain, so I want to make some modifications to the technical compartment in here so that I can fit my DIY diesel generator. If you're new to my channel, this lovely looking sailboat here is Athena. She's a 1987 Warrior 38 that I'm about four years into refitting. It's been a super fun challenge and I've learned a lot and I now know every square millimeter of my boat. The plan is for my fiance Ava and I to move aboard in a little under a year and start cruising. This right here is my DIY diesel generator. I'm waiting for a very specific flywheel housing that'll allow me to mount this alternator in line with the engine. Unfortunately, it's going to be a few months until it shows up, but when it does, the generator is going to be kind of long and narrow. My plan is to install the generator up here on this old bunk in the technical compartment, but to be able to fit the shape of the generator a little bit better, I am going to lower a section of the old bunk. The installation of the generator is going to end up being a little bit of a compromise, because of course I would like to have that weight down as low as I can possibly get it, but I can't lower the bunk too much because of the curvature of the hull, it would get very narrow and I wouldn't be able to fit the generator. Before I get trigger happy and start tearing into the technical compartment, I better just update my little board here. So this week I'm going to be working on painting the hull. I won't be able to finish that, but I should hopefully be able to apply all of the epoxy primer. And then of course there is modifying the technical compartment. And also I've got a friend of mine that's going to pop by on Thursday and I think we might be able to activate the cover coat. After a little bit of fiddling around, I ended up building myself a little mock-up of the generator, just like I did with the washer and the dryer in the forward cabin. With the mock-up, it was pretty easy to figure out that that is as low as I can possibly go. I've still got room underneath the generator to run all of the conduit and all of the hoses that needs to go from the head and into the technical compartment. Also, there is plenty of room above the generator, which is kind of nice. And where the camera is located now, there's room enough for the little diesel heater and pump possibly the isolation transformer. I wouldn't go as far as calling my little technical compartment here cavernous, but there is very good access to the generator, the heater, the isolation transformer, also the main engine and the diesel tank plus the storage that's beneath this old bunk. Unfortunately, having made it this far in the process of figuring out the little technical area there, the next step is, yes, you guessed it, plenty of oh glorious sanding. It's time to get itchy. God dang fiddlesticks. In the middle of the uh, oh glorious sanding, my oh glorious camera decided to call it quits. Please turn off the camera and then on again. Okay, so let's do that. Yep, nope, right and proper hooped. And yes, I have tried the exact same thing just using the off and on switch up here. See, turns off, turn on. Oh, great. Yep, 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 yep. I think my Panasonic GH5 is 100% dead. Part of the shutter is broken off and stuck in front of the sensor. And I am almost certain that it's going to be cheaper for me to go with a new camera rather than try and fix the old one. The good news is that I have this old Panasonic GH4 that I can use until I figure out what to do. It's not quite as nice as the GH5, but it'll certainly do. The most annoying thing about the GH5 dying on me is the fact that in the process of doing so, it managed to, as its very last act here on Earth, corrupt all almost all of the files on the SD card. So I've lost a bunch of footage. But let's forget all about the camera stuff. Today is Thursday and in about an hour or so, an old friend of mine named Ole is swinging by to say hi and also to lend a hand activating the cover coat. Cover coat is the anti-fouling system I've chosen to go with here aboard Athena and it's a little bit different than what you'll see on most boats. Cover coat consists of a special epoxy and some very, very fine copper powder. Applying and prepping to apply copper coat is a little bit of a pain in the behind because to 
prep for applying copper coat, you have to get rid of all the old anti-fouling and any old loose primer and apply new primer. All of that can be a lot of work. And also applying the copper coat is a lot of work. When we did it to Athena, I think we were four or five guys and it took almost an entire day to get the six coats on there. Once you've gone through the hassle of prepping and applying the copper coat, the upside to copper coat is that it's supposed to last for a very long time. I know of multiple boats that have had their copper coat on for over 10 years and it's still good. The decision on whether or not to go with copper coat is a little bit of a balancing act because sure it's expensive now and also there's a lot of work now but the potential reward is that you don't necessarily have to haul the boat every year to apply new anti-fouling because you can just scrub the copper coat with the boat in the water. I'm very excited to see how the copper coat is going to work out aboard Athena but uh, yeah for today all we need to do is just to activate the copper coat. The word act Activate is what I think the manual calls it. In reality, it's just a fancy term for slightly abrading the surface because once you apply the mixed copper coat, you'll end up with something like this. Here's the hull with its barrier coat and then on the outside of that is the copper coat. And as you can see, all these little dots here that's supposed to represent the very fine copper powder. All of these little copper particles are suspended and encapsulated in the epoxy. And that means the water can't get to the copper. Copper has been used for anti-fouling basically forever and it's very well proven to work. But of course it only works if the water can actually get in contact with the copper Otherwise, it's just a surface of epoxy. So what Ola and I am going to be doing today is just very lightly sanding or scuffing the surface to expose the copper. I talked to the Danish distributor of copper coat and he recommends using scotch bite pads for the uh, activation step. I'll grab a couple of buckets of warm water and just add a single drop of soap to each and then Ola and I can get busy scrubbing. <laughs> The activation of the copper coat didn't turn out to be a complete success. We didn't finish the hull yesterday. There are large areas that needs a lot more scrubbing or sanding. I think I might try to go ahead using some 320 grit sandpaper instead of the scotch bright pads. Today's a nice dry day, so I think we'll table the copper coat until the next rainy day and then switch to applying some epoxy primer to the faired areas. After we ran out of scotch bright pads yesterday, Ola and I applied a little bit of polyester filler to the pinholes in the faired areas. In preparation of applying more epoxy primer, I've just gone ahead and lightly sanded all of the fared areas. Last week I applied epoxy primer with one of these mohair rollers and it wasn't really a great experience. I used these because I didn't have any foam rollers here in the workshop that are suited for the epoxy primer. Earlier this week these foam rollers showed up and these should hopefully be okay for the epoxy primer, meaning they shouldn't start to swell up or disintegrate when used with the epoxy primer. I'll get some some paint mixed up and uh, then we can take the new rollers for a spin. Oh, let's see how this goes. Usually it takes a few minutes for the rollers to start disintegrating or swelling up, so uh, we'll see. And that is the second coat of epoxy primer done. Now there's only four more left. The coat is looking nice and silky smooth. I did a lot better with the foam rollers. Speaking of the foam roller, it did expand a little bit, but there's no sign of it disintegrating, so maybe these are okay to use. Yesterday I got the third coat of epoxy primer applied to the ferret areas and in between the coats I worked on the technical compartment. According to the TDS the minimum overcoating interval for the epoxy primer given the temperature we've got here right now is somewhere between three and four hours. So I do have a little bit of waiting to do in between coats. I used that time to cut the holes I need to run all of the cables and conduit into the technical compartment. And I also put in place little large supports that we'll use later today when we put the top on this little compartment. When I arrived at Athena this morning, there was a lot of dew on the hull. So I very quickly just wiped that down and now I'm waiting for the hull to dry before I can apply the fourth coat of epoxy primer. And the goal for today is to apply the fourth, fifth and sixth coat of epoxy primer. 
And of course, in between the coats, I'm going to be working on the technical compartment. There's not going to be a lot of storage underneath the generator because of all the conduit and hoses, but it would still be nice to get in there because there are going to be some drains from the top that's going to go here. And well, in general, it would just be nice to be able to get in there. So let's cut some holes in the front. Let's see if we can get these holes roughly centered. That is certainly good enough for government work. I've just checked the hull and it seems nice and dry to me, so I better hurry up and get the next coat of epoxy primer on there. For the fun of it, I'm going to time the application just to give myself an idea of how much time I actually use per coat. But I'm not going to show you guys the application of the primer because it's just going to be white going on white and you wouldn't be able to see it anyways. That's the fourth coat applied. It took one hour and 19 minutes. Like I said, now I have to wait three to four hours until I can apply the next coat. While I'm waiting for that, let's move ahead with the technical compartment. I've got a piece of 18 millimeter plywood that should be perfect for the top. This is going to get tabbed on three of its four sides, so it doesn't have to be super precise. So far, so good. Now there's just a small matter of the curvature of the hull. This is going to be the future home of Mr. Generator. If there is anything infernal combustion engines are known for, especially aboard boats, it is every once in a while causing a giant mess. So I want to make sure the area underneath the generator can drain. A few years back, I accidentally ordered eight or ten of these and all I really needed was two. So I have a little bit of a surplus. I could certainly make do with a smaller diameter for the area underneath the generator, but seeing as I've got a ton of these, I might as well use them. Ideally, I would want these to be flush mount, but yeah, these are not that. However, I can just countersink these into the plywood a little bit. One of the really cool things about these true design fittings is that epoxy bonds really well to this plastic. In fact, if you read the manual, epoxy is one of the recommended uh, bedding compounds for uh, installing through holes from true design. Now I can fill the little gap here with some thickened epoxy and presto flush mount. I think that looks pretty good. Now, while the epoxy is curing, I can take care of some more sanding in the technical compartment. The last item on my technical compartment to-do list for today is to knock loose any paint so I can start priming and sealing the plywood. That's the first coat of primer underneath the generator area. I was in the middle of checking the ferret areas for pinholes just to make sure that Ola and I didn't miss anything when I felt something. Drops of rain. Yep, I think that was it for the painting portion of the day. Fortunately, the primer I've applied today has been on there long enough that it doesn't matter if it starts raining. It's just a little bit annoying because I was really hoping I could finish the epoxy primer today. I doubt we're gonna get any serious amount of rain. So while I don't wanna paint, there's still other stuff I can do. This is a big box of cleats. It's all six cleats that I'll need for Athena. Some of you might remember that I was planning on casting cleats with Mr. Cement Boat Guy and while that would have been a lot of fun, it's just the time is not there. These are 30 centimeters or 12 inches and they're very similar to the ones Athena came with. So I think these are gonna be perfectly fine. I know somebody is gonna object saying that these two legs should be further apart so you can run a line through there, but I've never used that feature aboard Oblix. So yeah, these are perfectly fine with me. There's a really cool Boat US article where they test a bunch of different types of cleats to see what fails, if it's the cleat or if it's the fastener and I'll include a link for that down in the description. It's pretty old, but I think it's very interesting. I want to through bolt these with some epoxy filled holes. So of course, I'm going to have to drill some oversized holes and fill those. And that I think is okay to do, even if there's a slight chance of rain. If it starts raining, I can just cover the holes. 
Because the hole distance is different on the new cleats, I'm just gonna drill a single hole from down below and then we can head up on deck and line the cleat up. Of course it turns out the uh, old cleats were not aligned. This one over there was about this much further forward compared to this one, and this one was about this much further inboard than that one. Figuring out the position of the cleats now is kind of cool because that'll allow me to paint up and around the cleats and I think that'll look pretty cool. The two forward cleats were pretty straightforward except for the uh, crawling around inside of the chain locker to apply the tape. But what I'm really looking forward to are the two aft cleats. And when I say looking forward to, of course I mean dreading. Because the old teak deck extended out over this hump here. And if memory serves, the old cleats were located pretty far outboard. You probably can't see it on the video, but two of the holes from the old cleat was located outside of the core in the deck. But you know what? It's actually okay, because back there there's no foam core, it's all plywood. So I can basically put the cleat wherever I want. Normally, when through bolting something through a deck with a foam core, you would dig out some of the foam and replace it with wood or plywood, something that can handle the compression a little bit better. That was why I was so eager to place the new cleats relatively close to the old ones. When rebuilding Athena's deck, I enlarged those reinforcements a little bit, but placed them in the same location as the old ones. But uh, of course, I don't have to worry about that with the aft cleats. This looks like a good placement to me. It's as far aft as I can go, considering the width of the core, and it's right up against the forward edge of this piece of plywood back here, so that should be very strong. Yesterday, I got all 24 holes drilled and filled with thickened epoxy. I then covered them up with a little bit of plastic to keep any rain off of the epoxy. With that out of the way, the task of installing the cleats is gonna be super quick. The machine shop I'm hoping can help me make a keyway in the rudder stock and the tiller arm opens Monday, so hopefully in the not too distant future I can also install the rudder. I've also ordered all of the through holes I need, so yeah, things are trucking along. Today being Sunday, I've only got a few hours until I need to start rendering this video, but I should still be able to get a little bit done. Like for instance, applying another coat of primer here in the technical compartment. Ta-da! The generator area should be ready for final assembly next week. The next item on my mini to-do list for today was to patch that hole that used to be the old exhaust from the main engine. Patching that hole was kind of the last thing holding me back from hooking up my Volvo D240, the main engine here aboard Athena. I picked up a couple of new exhaust through holes, one for the main engine and one for the generator. Of course, just like with the cleats, I can't really install these until after I'm done painting, but it's still a step in the right direction towards getting Athena back in the water. This week has been pretty dang frustrating to be honest. First the GH5 died on me, but since then I keep on getting corrupted files on my GH4. I've never had that issue before with a GH4 and I don't know why, but I've had to reshoot a lot of this video, which just, it's really frustrating. Fingers crossed I'll have more luck next week. And uh, speaking of next week, it looks like the weather is supposed to be nice and dry, which means lots of time for painting. I only need another two coats of epoxy primer, then I need two coats of undercoat and three coats of Perfection Pro. And the undercoat and Perfection Pro, I believe, is supposed to arrive late next week. I want to end this video by saying a great big thank you to my patrons, which uh, they are the only reason I didn't lose the remainder of my hair when the GH5 died. So thank you so much for your support, guys. And uh, well, I hope to see all of you guys back here aboard Athena next week for some glorious painting and uh, yet more sanding. As always, feel free to leave a comment down below. And don't forget, if you've enjoyed this video, remember to leave a like. See you!